There we go. Um, so back to digital categories. Um, so uh, the confusion comes down to how much image manipulation is uh, is permitted for the categories. Um, creative, there's no limit. Um, the, and in terms of uh, considering or understanding the category, uh, the idea is that you're creating an image that is not a representation of reality. Um, sometimes when I see images in this category, it's a image where someone has applied a filter, but doesn't make significant changes to the image and doesn't enhance the image and still going to fit this category, but it uh, probably isn't going to score very well. And it would not be eligible for the pictorial category because of the filter that's been applied. So pictorial, uh, pictorial. Um, so the intention is that it's looks like a straight photograph. Um, HDR is okay as long as it looks natural. You can do the traditional cropping, lightening and darkening uh, that uh, we old folks think of as a darkroom skill. But if you do any compositing or filters, then that would not be allowed in, in this category. And one other note, uh, in, in terms of image manipulation uh, with the nature category, there's a whole range of criteria, but the one that I wanted to focus on is that you're not allowed to do cloning or uh, deleting pieces of the image, re rearranging, combining two images together, no special effects filters, so. Questions about any of that? And the last thing I've got to share is that the next, uh, June salon is on June 7, or the, the next salon is on June 7. Deadline is May 17th. The assignment is solitude. And uh, some of us, many of us also submit images to N4C. Uh, the deadline for the May competition is May 10. And a reminder that there won't be a June, July, or August comes competition for N4C. That's it for me. Um, let me hand this over to Don Trednick. He's going to introduce himself. I included a, a link to his website in the news about this presentation coming up. So please take a look at that. He's got lots of classes coming up, lots of great images. So, okay, let me. Okay, Don, you are now the host. Looks good. Do you mind just bringing it back down to where it was the sure. screen? I'm not tall enough to do that, and we still don't have the study. So that would be a little bit sure. to me. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Uh, got the mic. Okay, so yeah, so hopefully people can hear me. I don't know if they can or not. So um, let's ask. Um, was working a little bit ago, but now I'm not hearing it coming through the speaker. So I don't know if that's actually doing anything or not. Yeah, I think I'm just picking up with your screen. Yeah, you can hear it. Yeah, when I tested it, it came through there, but now I'm not hearing it coming through there at all. Is there a switch on? Well, it's, yeah, it's like a little light. I can see it going off and on again. Okay, I can. Maybe that was it. Maybe it just needed to be recycled. Oh. And everybody's saying they can hear. So, okay. <laughs> probably, probably the most important because I know that I can talk loud enough for people in the room to hear me, but I, I don't talk that loud to get everybody you know, elsewhere. Great. Take it away. So, let's see if we can maybe clear a little bit of the stuff up the oh, side there. Sure. Better. Um, make it a little bit easier for uh, folks to see everything that's going on. So, uh, so I'm Don Tredenic. I run Frozen Hiker Photography, and um, a little bit of a delay there from what I saw there, like <laughs> for some reason. Uh, so I teach at a number of different places. Uh, the majority of which is at the University of Minnesota's Landscape Arboretum. Been doing that for. I think about 10 years now, actually. It's been quite a while um, since I, I was brought on board there. Uh, Centennial School District, I do things through their community education program. Just recently also signed on with Roseville. Uh, there's a really kind of cool place in Lakeville for a lot of stuff I do is nature, wildlife photography, that, that sort of thing. But when I want to do something really unique, there's a place called Hot Sam's Photo Park. And Hot Sam's Photo Park is this Unique collection of stuff is about the best way to put it. So they have things, or they used to have a submarine. Uh, they have one of the sharks from Jaws. They have a giant Tweety bird. They've got a bunch of old cars, an old police paddy wagon, a tiki hut, a hippie van, um, aliens, a spaceship, a flying saucer. There are two different things I learned from looking over there. Um, it's a lot of just fun stuff. So we do some different kinds of things over there. And then also I, I do some programs at the Minnesota Valley uh, National Wildlife Refuge as well. I do about five programs for them a year. And then private lessons and, and that sort of thing. So keeps me busy and keeps me out of trouble. So a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of stuff going on. I do have a website, um, as I was mentioned before, uh, frozenhiker.com. That's usually the best place to go and find out what I've got going on. I'll admit I even, Occasionally, I have to go out there to find out what I have going on because I kind of lose track sometimes. It's like, okay, somebody wants me to do something in May. What's what do I have actually going on? So, uh, so that's the best place to go and, and see what I have uh, happening. Uh, also, um, if there are changes, so like the, the National Wildlife Refuge is a good example. If there's a program, let's say there's a program on the, the 29th, I think is when my next one is for them, and the area that we're going to uh, might end up being flooded. Actually, there is a extremely good chance that the area that we're planning on using will be flooded. That's that organization is run by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So, as you can imagine, if we discover on a Friday that it's flooded, chances are their website's not going to be updated for Saturday because it's got to go through a bunch of people in Washington or wherever U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service exists. And so, the best place to find out. That kind of thing is a program still on. I just always check my site because I can update this in minutes as I find out if things are going on. So, um, so especially for, for those kind of programs. Uh, in terms of the Arboretum, a uh, number of things coming up. Um, kind of halfway through the year, uh, we do have a uh, flower photography one coming up here in just a few weeks um, in May. And then we've got some things in uh, June. Um, and then quite a bit in the fall. Fall tends to get really, uh, really busy. Uh, the uh, the Lightroom and, and Photoshop classes tend to be really popular. Uh, so those do tend to sell out. So th those are ones if, if you're thinking about doing or, or get to sign up for early. And I don't have a whole lot of visibility to where they are in terms of, of the registrations on that. They, they don't share that with me other than saying, hey, your class will know. It's like, oh, okay, good to know. 
Uh, in terms of Centennial, um, going to have a spring flower sitting there. It's probably based. It probably doesn't apply a whole lot to, to this club, but uh, that tends to be pretty popular. Uh, we did replace the minimalism one. Uh, Centennial approached me uh, a few months ago uh, about doing a youth program uh, for them. So we swapped that out. It's going to be a four-week program. It'll start uh, end of July, go through the, the middle of August. So pretty excited about that. I used to run a program like that at St. Paul years ago. Uh, so it's, it's kind of fun to, to go through and, and do that. In fact, I was filling out some paperwork for that uh, this afternoon for background checks and that sort of thing. Now I also do some of my own independent stuff. So a number of oh, weekend workshops, but the Route 66 in Arizona one is actually a week long. Um, that one, uh, originally my plan was to first start offering that um, three years ago. But unfortunately, three years ago, COVID hit. Uh, so we had everything scouted out. We knew all the places we wanted to go and then we, we couldn't go. So I've been out there since uh, making sure that the places are still uh, good, still available. Turns out one of them wasn't. One of them doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately, um, due to high winds. But uh, yeah, looking forward to that. It, it's about half full right now. And then winter on the North Shore, that one sold out this year. We already have next year's registration up. And then uh, down in Pepin, Wisconsin, we have a program coming up in June with some horses that used to be formerly wild uh, Mustangs. So kind, kind of cool to Either I've known Shirley down there for a number of years now, so we've been doing programs down there. In terms of tonight, what we're going to talk about, uh, let's start just talking about some different approaches to flower photography. Um, different people kind of approach it different ways. Uh, talk about some of the challenges that, that people run into. Uh, one of the biggest ones being depth of field, uh, both too much and, and too little. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Focusing techniques. Uh, talk a, a little bit about lighting. Actually, we'll talk quite a bit about lighting. Uh, I think that's really kind of makes or breaks a lot of these issues. And then we'll talk uh, about some composition tips and then uh, then kind of wrap it up from there. So I call this near, far, and everything in between when it comes to approaches to flower photography. And in fact, um, about five years ago, I was given this uh, program, actually the, the longer version, which is the, the class version out at the Arboretum. And there, there are two women uh, taking the class that were actually from the Garden Society there. And they said, you know, the shooting things from a distance is more of the kinds of things that we're interested in because we need to take photos. Um, turns out if you want to compete in um, garden competitions, you have to actually submit photos of your garden to whatever group that is. In order, you can't just say, I'm going to, Compete in the contest, you have to actually apply and provide all this stuff. So they were really interested in that. It actually turned into a whole separate course that I do now for guard clubs. Um, but a lot of times, what we think about, um, especially people who are relatively new to flower photography, is really close ups. So macros or, or close up photography, um, which is really a, a single subject that's really going to dominate uh, the frame. And you know, it could be a square crop like these, or it could be a more uh, traditional crop of two by three, eight by 10, or whatever that happens to be. But the flower pretty much takes up, you know, the entire thing. One of the things I see a lot when uh, working with like nature photography clubs, so like the Minnesota um, Nature Photography Club, as an example, is you see a lot of things in habitat. And I think these are a little bit more challenging to do a good job with because you still want to have that, that single subject or the single grouping of subject, but you want to give some hints as to where it's located, what's around it. And so how do you do that without uh, going through and overwhelming your subject with everything that's in the background? And so we'll talk more about that a little bit later, some techniques to, to deal with that, but that really falls into that habitat uh, category. And then there's the landscape. Um, and sunflowers make for a great carpet of, of flowers, but really it's, um, you're looking at, at an overall area and you still need to have some things within that that can grab the viewer's attention. The thing I like about uh, sunflowers is whenever you have a sunflower field, you always have a couple of overachievers. So those always work out really well for that thing to grab the eye. So people on the, on the Zoom can't see it, 
But those of you in the room, you can, if you look back here, we've got one of those overachievers. So for the people on, on Zoom, if you look way in the back, you'll see there's one sunflower that's sticking way up above uh, all the others. Um, why one grows like that and not more of them, um, not quite sure. Um, but just kind of a fun sort of uh, thing to look for. But you definitely want to have something that's going to grab somebody's attention, provide that anchor point uh, within that. And then sometimes the flowers themselves are more of an accent. So you know, they dress up just an ordinary scene or just add a little bit of extra to, to a scene. Uh, I have a, a photo hanging in my dining room uh, of an elephant. And when I first told my wife, hey, I'm going to put the elephant photo in the dining room, she kind of gave me kind of a strange look. So, really? But the elephant is eating, you know, but it's sticking its head out through some grass, but above its head, going all the way across are all of these white flowers. So it really adds a nice bit of interest uh, to the scene. And then there's creative. And this is where you can start to have a lot of fun, where you can start to play with things um, like depth of field. You can start playing with things uh, like composite images. Um, not if you're gonna enter the, the nature context. So just throw that disclaimer out there. Uh, but you can start doing a lot of really kind of interesting things uh, with it. Uh, this was a shot I took probably 15 years ago. Um, and the, the thing that was interesting was I wanted to have a sense with, with the tulip in the front, but still have enough detail that you knew it was within this, this tulip garden, but have those really nicely faded out. And so playing with depth of field, I actually um, focused on my hand a little bit in front of this so that I made sure that there was nothing else. If you've ever seen tulips, you know that they grow really close together. So having those others blurred like that was really tough. And so I actually had my hand in front focused on my hand. So I had that focus plane out ahead of where um, the flowers were. So I just had that one uh, that was actually uh, within focus. Uh, wind movement can also add some really nice things. So that kind of leads into managing depth of field. And managing depth of field can really uh, ruin an image if you're not careful. And this is a great example of an image that's been completely ruined by having too much depth of field. There's just way too much going on in the background. I've got hot spots, I've got leaves, I've got, uh, I don't know if you call them branches because it's a flower, but, uh, but just a lot of just stuff happening there. And so, we really want to figure out, you know, how can we go about, you know, dealing with this? And there are some things that we could do, you know, just based on the capabilities of the lens in terms of aperture by moving closer, moving further, using a different focal length. Um, and there, there's a lot of different things we've tried to do to kind of find balance. And so one of the things that uh, I tell people that, that I work with is, what is it about this shot that you really want to emphasize? You don't necessarily have to have the entire uh, image in focus. There, you could use a real shallow depth of field if there's something really interesting happening in just part of it. Um, or you may need to have the entire flower uh, sharp, uh, or you may need to um, you know, have you know, just, just a slice or two. So one thing to remember though, is that depth of field also affects the foreground. And so with this image, we can see having these couple of petals in the front that are pointing straight at you and are kind of bright, that does provide a little bit of a distraction uh, to this, this image. So we need to think about that um, as well. So, as kind of a general rule, until you get really close, the depth of field is going to extend from about a third of where you're focused towards the camera to two thirds behind it for whatever that, that depth of field is. And so if we keep that in mind, that will help us um, to determine how much of that we're going to um, actually have in, in focus. And what I like to do is I typically like to have my focus set, um, you know, towards the forward part uh, of the subject. Um, but 
that sometimes means I have to do some manual uh, tweaking of my, my focus. And then I know whatever you mentioned, manual anything, uh, tends to get you know people a little bit nervous in terms of, you know, okay, what do you mean I'm gonna manually focus? I just spent thousands of dollars on all these autofocus lenses and now you're telling me to manually turn that thing. Uh, I don't even want that thing to be turnable. Uh, but you know, sometimes you just have to do just that little bit of tweaking to it. And, and this is a, a good example. So here, you know, the fact that the pedals are soft doesn't really matter because that's not what I really wanted to bring out. What I really wanted to bring out is the hoverfly and the, the stamens in that in the middle and have everything else just be nicely blurred around that to really kind of bring your eye to that one spot. Uh, I will tell you that if you do take a photo like this and it is a hoverfly, uh, don't post it any place and refer to it as AB. You will get all kinds of hate posts coming back at you. Uh, I didn't even know hoverfly was a thing before I, I posted this. I do know. So when it comes to depth of field, and I talked a little bit about this already, there's three adjustments that we can make. The first is the aperture. If we have a wide open aperture, so if you have a lens that's 2.8, you have it at 2.8 or at 4 or at 4, whatever your lens is, whatever that widest aperture is, which is the smallest number, which I always thought was kind of interesting. Uh, I'm convinced it's how camera manufacturers like to mess with us. Um, that's going to give you the shallowest, shallowest uh, depth of field. On the other hand, if you go to like an F22 or something like that, that's going to give you a lot of depth of field, but it's going to bring some other issues along with it, things like the fraction. Uh, now, if you shoot with a digital SLR, you do have one um, advantage over people that shoot with mirrorless, and that is your camera more than likely has a depth of field preview button. So the way cameras work and the way autofocus works um, is when you're looking through the viewfinder, whether it's an electric viewfinder or if it's a digital SR where you're looking through the lens, the aperture is always wide open. Uh, there's a number of reasons for that. Autofocus needs it. Um, also, it's really dark. Um, if it, if it closes down and you're looking through a viewfinder of a digital SLR. But with this button, what it does is it actually closes down the aperture to what you actually have it set to. So you can kind of see, kind of being the key word there, key two words there, what your depth of field actually looks like. The reason I say kind of is it gets very dark because not as much light is coming through at that point because it's not taking the photo, it's just closing down the amount of light coming through. But you can get a sense of that. With mirrorless cameras, that's not there because you're always looking at an LCD, even when you're looking through the viewfinder. And so that's one capability that does not come forward with a mirrorless camera. Um, there's also physical distance from the subject. And so the further we move back, the more depth of field we gain. So this is something that I talk about quite a bit in a number of, of uh, the classes that I teach is to get more depth of field, move back and then crop in. And then the question always comes up, well, if I'm cropping in though, I'm throwing away all the pixels. And that used to be a concern back when cameras were eight megapixels, four megapixels. But now cameras are, most cameras are in the 20 to 24 megapixel range. You have the landscape cameras, um, like the ones I have, they're 40 plus megapixels. Sony, I think just came out with a 60 megapixel. Um, to put it into perspective, uh, if you're posting on Facebook, Instagram, pick your favorite you know, social media app, the image that you're posting is less than two megapixels. That's it. If you're putting it as wallpaper on your monitor and you have a very high-end 4K monitor, it's about eight megapixels. So if you have a 24 megapixel image, you can throw two thirds of that image away and still have enough image quality for anything that you want to display. Now, what about printing? So printing, um, same kind of thing. So I used to have um, in the room that's now our, our workout room at your home, a photo I took at your 70 years ago, a uh, long time ago. I was shooting a, a D300 at the time. No, actually I was shooting a D70 at the time. It's about eight megapixel camera. 
And I had a 20 by 30 image um, printed hanging in that room that looked just fine. So you can do a lot with you know, anything that's eight megapixels on up. So don't worry about cropping down. You've, you've got plenty to uh, plenty to work with. And then of course, focal length also. The longer the focal length of the lens, the, the less uh, the depth of field. So how do you go about knowing what's what, what's there? Well, there's an app for that. Um, <laughs> and if you were taking one of my classes, you would actually see the mathematical formula before the app, because uh, I also have a degree in math. And so I like to throw math into my programs as much as possible. Uh, I actually use this one, simple DOF calculator. You'll see a bunch of screenshots of it coming up here soon. It does also put it in inches and feet, so don't let the meters part scare you. You'll notice it doesn't get the greatest ratings. It's three and a half stars, and it's probably less than that now because they haven't done a good job of keeping up with new cameras. Uh, but it turns out it really doesn't matter. Uh, I just like it for me, it's much more intuitive, but there's other ones out there as well. Uh, if you have an Android phone, um, they tend to be free. If you have an iPhone like I do, you tend to have to pay for everything. So that's just one more drawback. Uh, I like to say I picked the most expensive option of everything that I have. So uh, iPhone, Nikon, you know, all that. So let's look at the effect of, of aperture settings uh, with this ORCID. And so um, these shots were all taken uh, with a 90 millimeter Tamron uh, lens. Uh, I love that lens. Uh, in fact, I even won in, uh, an international competition uh, with it. Loved it so much that I actually wore it out. It's the only lens I've actually worn out. Um, but it, it was a great lens. So 90 millimeter lens, 20 inches from the subject, uh, even though the lens was an f2.8, it turned out it kind of depended on where you are and where you were focused, what your maximum aperture was. So maximum aperture is actually 3.3 instead of 2.8, which was a little annoying. Um, so you know, looking at, at the app, I can see that gives me two tenths of an inch of depth of field. That is a really, really tiny area to work in. And if we look at an orchid, Challenge with orchids is they always have something that extends, no matter what kind of orchid it is, whether it's a lady slipper or what, you know, one like this. And so I can see here, you know, this area here is, is pretty good actually. It looks a little soft just from the projector, but that, that center of that, keep remembering there's people on Zoom. So uh, the center of that, that first bloom uh, actually looks pretty good. Um, the thing that drives the people at the Arboretum crazy when I show this is, I don't know the terms of most of these parts of an orchid. So I refer to them as the jaws, the front, and they're like, yeah, you can leave the building now. Um, but you can see those are really soft and everything else is really soft as well. So what if I go and just change my aperture? So don't do anything different. I just change the aperture to F8. Well, now I have a half an inch. So just going from 3.3 to um, F8, more than doubled my depth of field. So I've got a half an inch of depth of field. That first bloom now is just really nice and sharp. Even some of the, the buds around it are looking really good. The others are still pretty soft. So can I improve that by actually going a little bit further? Let's go to F16. And this was the kind of thing back in the film days uh, that we used to do quite a bit. Uh, we go F16, we go F22. Uh, almost any macro shot was taken you know, with that. But on, now in this case, I've got just about an inch, 0.99 inches. So really an inch of depth of field. So I've doubled my depth of field again. Now I can see uh, those first two blooms. Now they're pretty good. It's a little soft on the third one. Uh, I can decide whether or not I like that or not. Um, but let's see if I just go a little bit more. So F22 now. Um, almost an inch and a half, so 1.4 inches. So I've added a lot more depth. Now all of those blooms look really good. The buds, everything looks good. The stem is still a little soft, but actually I'm, I'm kind of okay with that. Now the thing that's interesting about macro lenses is for most lenses, F22, you're kind of at that smallest aperture. Macro lenses let you go much, much further. So an F36, which has to be like a little pinhole um, letting light through, now everything is nice and sharp, but 
know, and it's kind of hard to see here in the room, but, but those of you watching on Zoom will definitely see this. There's all of these little other artifacts that have shown up. And this is also something you'll see in landscape photography. If you're shooting um, above F14, you'll start seeing all of this sensor dust that's sitting on your sensor. It's gonna just start showing up more and more. When you go to F36, this is actually showing dust that's actually on the front of the lens, which normally you would never see show up any other way. Um, also, typically, if you look in most lenses, you'll see there's little bits of stuff just in them, which you can't really do anything about because it's inside. How it gets in there, I don't know, but it's just there. So that's one more thing you have to worry about when you stop down. You also get this issue of diffraction where you actually start losing sharpness because of how the, the light waves are bouncing around inside the lens. So there's a little bit of a, a compare and contrast. Um, you know, just have these five images sitting here showing that, you know, the different uh, apertures and what that is doing in terms of the, the depth of field. Um, this is definitely one of the things, though, if you're watching the, the recording of this later, um, you know, this is, you know, definitely one of the slides to kind of go back to, just to kind of refer to to see, you know, what that, how that affects it. So what about distance and distance to the subject? So um, 90 millimeter lens, macro lens, I, I don't have the option of changing uh, focal length of the lens because it, it's a prime lens, but I can move back further. So if I go to 16 inches from the subject, aperture F8, uh, this lens F8 is where it performs its best. Most lenses actually F8 uh, is where they, they perform their best. There are exceptions. Um, I've got a 14 to 24 that actually a 5.6 seems to be its best spot. But in general, F8 is where most lenses actually give you the best uh, image quality. And so looking at this, plugging everything in, I can see about know, three tenths of an inch. Um, the first bloom is okay. Uh, again, the, the, the jaws are a little bit soft on it, um, but you know, it's kind of a starting point. So if I move back to 24 inches, now I get a lot more of the, the flower in there, um, but I've got three quarters of an inch of depth of field. So it's looking a lot better, but to get that same composition that I wanted, I need to crop in. Well, now this works really well. Um, this is enough depth of field for what I wanted for my composition. Everything is really nice and sharp. I could go back further. And so if I go to three feet away, now I can see I've got uh, an inch and three quarters. Now, if I crop in, you know, everything is definitely tack sharp uh, at this point. So, you know, I'm pretty happy with that, but I did give away quite a bit. Um, and so this kind of shows here how much cropping had to be done in order to get that image. And you know, one of the things I mentioned, you know, earlier is you could crop away two thirds of, of the image and still have something that's pretty workable. But if we look at the one that's three feet away, 36 inches away, I'm actually throwing away a lot more than that. So I may be getting to that point where maybe I am cropping too much from that, that image. Kind of makes you want to dance. <laughs> so. Focus um, is another area where, um, you know, we can sometimes run into some challenges. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is sometimes autofocus won't work. Uh, something to do with um, just some of the reflectiveness and that um, of, the, of the flowers. Uh, autofocus really likes a lot of contrast. Is really, you know, one of the things that, that helps make it work. And sometimes it's really hard to tell in the viewfinder if you truly are in focus. And, you know, so, you know, when we look at, you know, those two things and then couple in the, or add the additional factor of every lens has a minimum focus distance that you need to be aware of. And that's the closest point that the lens will still focus. And a lot of times because of where a flower could be, 
you're not going to necessarily be using something like a macro lens. You might actually be using something like a telephoto because you need to be back a little bit and you, know, you want to shoot in. But those telephoto lenses tend to have a really big uh, minimum focus distance point. So you just need to be uh, aware of, of what that's doing. One of the things that I found that really helps is to really leverage your LCD. Now, if you're shooting with a mirrorless camera, that's pretty easy because you're always looking at, at an LCD. Um, and so as you're looking at the LCD on your camera, whether it's a digital SLR or mirrorless, zoom all the way into 100%. Now, one of the things I've done with my cameras is I've assigned a button. And so I can just hit that button and it zooms to 100%. Then I can see what, what that looks like. I hit that button again, it goes back to, to normal. So that really does help to see, do I have things that are actually sharp? And so at that point, uh, I can manually adjust my focus to make sure I've got that really nice, really tack sharp make sure I've got my aperture set properly, and then take the shot. Movement is another thing that can really mess up your focus because your subject is moving in and out of where you've got your focus set up, plus you've got motion blur to deal with as well. Um, and the closer we get to a subject, the more movement is detectable. Um, took this shot, looks like 11 years ago, based on the Warmer. So this was a milkweed, uh, it was a really windy day. So this thing was just moving all around, but I liked how when the wind pushed on it, it looked like a flower in the center, just the way that the seeds all got moved out. This has also been one of my best sellers too. Um, so I just really like it. But the challenge was how do you get that sharp? Because it's moving, you know, pretty good. Well, there's a basic principle of physics that you can't go from moving in one direction to the other without coming to a complete stop. Now that stop is like that, and it's moving the other way. So if you observe it, you can start to get a sense of, okay, it's going to go over here, and it's going to come back here. So you can then start to set your focus for when it comes back over here, and then try to time it and take that shot. I, I will tell you that I did not get this in one take. Um, I don't know how many takes it was, but it was it was more than 20. I can tell you that for sure. Uh, a lot of patients, a lot of just sitting there, um, surrounded probably by a lot of ticks and a bunch of other stuff that they don't really want to think about. But just sitting there trying to find that movement allowed me to, to get this shot the way I wanted to. Can I ask? Sure. Do you have to use multiple focus points on your settings, or do you? So, do you have a preference? So, yeah, so, so I always use single point focus. Um, part of the reason is because of old. When I started, that's all cameras had. <laughs> yeah, the two half circles, you lined them up and then you were in focus. Otherwise, in fact, that's kind of funny. So, I use single point and I don't always like move it. I leave it there and then I move the camera focus and then come back. And it's like, you know, just hit that little wheel on the back, it'll go wherever you want it to go. But, um, just you know, forty years of doing that, you, know, you just kind of kind of get there. So that's that's what I typically use, except for wildlife. So with wildlife, um, I, I switched to mirrorless, completely mirrorless, uh, about a year and a half ago. And the mirrorless cameras have these um, these focus modes where you, you set up a box. So it's like a large box that, that you set up. It's called wide area uh, focus. And then anything within that, you can tell it what you're trying to photograph. And so if it's wildlife, you say photographing animals, it'll actually look for eyes of animals within it and then track those within that box. It's just a, it's a game changer. Uh, it, it really is. For someone that, that shoots wildlife, um, I was shooting the, the trumpeter swans um, down here this past winter. It would pick them up when they were way out. It would already find those eyes and then just track them all the way in until, until they land it. It's just, it's really amazing uh, what they can do. It's not unique to, to Nikon, Sony has it, Canon has it, uh, Fuji has it, you know, all of the, the camera manufacturers have it. Olympus actually probably has the best um, when, it, when it comes to that. They even have a Formula One mode that um, will detect Formula One cars. So not just vehicles, but specifically for Formula One. So they must have a really high-end client to cause that feature to be there. Uh, but yeah, I was, I was amazed. 
uh, when, when I discovered that. I, I work with, uh, I have, have a woman who's been taking lessons with me uh, for about two and a half years now, a um, couple times a month, and she shoots Olympus. And when she got the new uh, OM1, uh, we're kind of going through, you know, all the stuff that's new. And I came across, I was like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, single point is, you know, typically what I do. Um, in terms of movement, um, you know, there, there's not a lot we can do about other things moving, but we can certainly, you know, deal with our own movement. Um, a good set of tripod legs that does not have a center post uh, for floral photography is really um, a, a key investment. Um, the reason for it is if you have a center post, you can only get that tripod down so low. And so if you're doing things like spring ephemerals, which tend to be about this big, um, you know, like past flowers right now are up, you know, things of that, that nature, you want to have a tripod that gets you right down on the ground. And people say, well, why not just use a bean bag or something like that? Well, um, a bean bag is not as stable as a tripod. With a tripod, you can you can get things on there. You can get it exactly how you want, and it's the chance of it moving are, are pretty slim. I personally find the ball head works better than some of the other types of, of tripod heads. I know the the uh, pan and tilt heads are starting to become really popular because of video and that sort of thing. But um, but for me, for flower photography, a, a ball head uh, tends to work um, you know much better. And then if you really want to get um, super precise, you can also get these focus rails that you can actually mount onto your, your ball head and just do little microscopic adjustments, moving the camera back and forth to get that exact uh, focus point. Um, that's for when you're getting really, really serious. Some other things to think about, patience. Um, probably one of the toughest things for a photographer to do. So that's waiting for the subject to come into focus. So I've talked about that already with, with the milkweed, but a lot of times they have insects in that on flowers, they're really the, the main subject. The flower is you know, really more of that, that accent piece, but you know, waiting for them, if you try to chase them around, number one, I don't care how good your autofocus system is, it's just not gonna lock on to them quick enough uh, to get the shot. Um, and the other is, is you're just never going to be in the right spot to, to actually do it. So um, bees, especially, the, you'll see they'll actually go around in a little pattern. There's a bunch of blooms together and they tend to have a favorite bloom that they go back to. I don't know if it's tastier or what it is that, that causes them to go back to it, but just kind of watch. You'll kind of get that sense, especially on sunflowers. They'll actually do the whole loop around the edge. We can also try to control the subject. Um, number of different ways. So um, you can try a wind block. Uh, wind blocks can be devised a number of different ways. I know people will bring a garbage bag with them and you'll kind of hold it out to, to block the wind. You can bring some really big friends with you, have them just stand there. You have, probably have to pay them off in pizza or burgers or beer or something later on. Uh, but if you do it too many times, they're just not gonna bother coming. Um, I know people that'll, Take up like an iris or uh, a daffodil or gladiola or something like that, you know, one of the long stalk type things, um, just like you would a tomato plant. They bring some ribbon and uh, that can get you into a lot of trouble though if you're in a public garden. But if you're doing it in your own garden, you can, you know, maybe get away with that. I always find when I try that, I always end up adding more movement than uh, eliminating it. So another thing we want to do is we want to manage the background. So watch for distracting elements back there. It's really easy to not notice them. You know, we start to think about, you know, getting everything within the flower itself um, to be perfect. We kind of forget about what's going on uh, in the background. And in this case, it was also worried about not getting stung by that wasp, which the same outing earlier, uh, one of them did actually get me, which, um, that's not fun. So let's talk now about lighting and the direction of light. And um, one of the things that, that I tell people, so my, my grandfather got me into photography when I was probably about seven or eight years old. And so I owe him a lot. I, I wouldn't be here in front of you today if it wasn't for him get, getting me involved in it. But the absolute worst advice that he gave me was always have the light over your shoulder. 
And what that does is that basically just kills uh, any kind of detail that you have in the shot. And so direction of light and how it hits the subject is really important because that will help define depth, texture, structure. This tulip, if I had that light over my shoulder, would look really flat. You wouldn't get that sense that this is actually a round tulip. It would just look completely flat. Now, because you know tulips, you would kind of sense that it, it's round, but the reality is you wouldn't see that. You've also probably heard in salons that you know the eye will go to the brightest place in the photo. So having your subject well lit also really helps uh, as well. And then we could also do it to just add some drama. If you have a little bit of light coming in, um, whether it's artificial light or the sunlight's coming through and opening in the trees, you know, it can really help things stand out as well and, and give that, that little bit of drama to it. So here's an example, just kind of looking side by side. We have a backlit, a uh, frontlit, and a sidelit. And if you notice the frontlit, compare that to the sidelit, there's a lot of difference in what you can see in terms of the detail uh, within that the flower. And so how can we go about working with it? Well, most of the times the main light source when it comes to flower photography, we don't have a whole lot of control over because it's wherever the sun happens to be in the sky at that particular time. But what we can do is we can make use of things like reflectors, shades, fill lights, uh, to go and enhance um, that light. So here's an example working with a, a reflector. The light source is coming from, from the lower right, resulting in, in a rather dark image. But if I take a reflector and bounce that light back, it makes a huge difference in what we can actually see within there. I can also just use fill light. And so here I've got uh, directional hard light coming in. It's causing some shadows that I don't really like in there that, that's kind of distracting. So I can just add some fill light using an artificial light source to reduce the, the shadows. And you don't have to have expensive lighting to do this. One of the things that you can use is just a, a very inexpensive uh, flashlight. Uh, just you know, go to the state fair and just pick up a, a bunch of them. Now you can go crazy, you can buy LED panels, you can buy ring lights, um, you know, a lot of different things out there, strobes, um, candles will work. That can add kind of a nice cool effect. Um, all of them are gonna cause some kind of a color cast. So just kind of be aware of that. Um, but one of the things that I've found works really well, especially if you're going to some of the, the public gardens, or as we're heading into spring with the ephemerals, is just carry a cheap flashlight. So kind of just attach to your keychain. That's typically enough light to get in there to just add that little bit that, that you need. So let's talk about composition tips and then we'll, we'll kind of wrap things up. So subject placement. Um, one of the things that we want to avoid is what's referred to as the bullseye. You might have heard that uh, come up in maybe some of your salons or some of the judges. Uh, if someone has had a flower that's just like dead center, straight on, uh, works great if you're taking photos for a seed catalog. But other than that, it's not a terribly interesting uh, photo. So one thing you can do is you can work with something that's referred to as the PowerPoints. And so if you just imagine a tic-tac-toe board sitting over the top of this, where those lines intersect, if you have uh, the point of emphasis on one of those spots, that's going to make for a little bit more interesting photo. Um, also, filling the frame can do quite a bit as well, uh, but also paying attention to the negative space, or basically everything where your subject isn't. Angles, one of the, one of probably the worst, but most valuable uh, exercises I was ever given when I was learning photography was photographing a Coke can. And so we we're all told, okay, here's your Coke can, take as many different photos of that Coke can as you can, and then when you're finished, go sit down. So we're all up, we're all taking photos of, of our Coke can. We go to sit down. Once everybody was sat down, said, okay, go take one more. It's like, 
you got to be kidding me. It's, there's no other thing. But what I've discovered is, especially for flower photography, that was just an invaluable lesson. So when you think you've taken every different angle you can, force yourself to try to find that one more. And the majority of time, that's the one that you actually end up keeping. Uh, it's got that little bit of uniqueness to it, just a little bit different, really kind of sets apart from the others that, that you see. We should also think about storytelling. And especially if you're using flowers as more of an accent, look for interesting objects that can add context. Um, I don't remember which park is, one of the state parks over in Minnesota, uh, just kind of walking through and saw this old wood duck. All somebody just leaned against the log there. I mean, obviously it's not gonna work as a nesting box because whatever gets in there, raccoons and that can easily get in. But I just thought given that, that sitting next to some rotted logs, uh, just added some nice context to the photos. You have all of the, these new spring ephemerals coming up. Um, so just kind of an interesting story there. And then we could also do other things to add interest as well. Uh, bugs, water, they'd be a great day to go find flowers uh, with water on them. Um, I know things like daffodils are up right now um, with all the rain. Water droplets are always a lot of fun. Relationships between things. Uh, so, you know, in this case, uh, between the, the fly and, and, the, uh, uh, and the flower itself, habitat, environment, all of these things can come into play. Skip over that since we already talked about that. So, how do we go about controlling the, the background? And one of the things that I, I've heard people refer to is just doing border patrol. So after you have your subject lined up, you've got your composition filled in, just kind of look around the edges of the photo to see what, what's going on. And the biggest challenge with flowers is a lot of times we'll have competing subjects, uh, especially if they're white flowers or yellow flowers, something that's a bright color, because rarely do they, um, are they just in isolation. Normally they're in a big field with a lot of others you know, with them. But always think, you know, is that background helping or hurting? And so as you're looking through the viewfinder, always be thinking about that. Uh, there's something called gardening. It's kind of controversial, uh, especially with, um, with wildflowers. You really don't want to um, pick or kill other living plants to get the shot. Uh, maybe you can just like push something out of the way if it's, if it's a problem. But, you know, um, there are people that, that do that. Uh, in terms of groupings, there's something about the number three and having three um, three of the subject within the shot. It's more natural. People uh, find that a little bit more pleasing. Two, on the other hand, is like the worst number because you tend to just kind of bounce between them. It's, it's not as um, calming. Odd numbers, for whatever reason, uh, work better. And then there's also something referred to as controlled chaos. And so this is where we have just a lot of stuff. And so we want to try to have everything within this type of an image sharp. Um, and we want to try to minimize the amount of clipping that's actually happening around the edges. Now you won't be able to get rid of all of it. So like this top one, you could see um, does have a little bit of that one clipped off. But in general, I tried to keep as many of these um, within the frame as possible. And ones that weren't there, I tried to position it so that um, I didn't have you know, too much of those. Or you could go way in and just like get really, really close. Um, and so this is actually an orchid. Uh, I think it looks like something from a science fiction movie. It looks like a little spaceship that's actually flying in there. Uh, so you can find a lot of really cool things that you just don't see with your eye when you go in really, really close. Or just get abstract. Play with the light, look for patterns, textures. This is actually shooting from behind. This kind of gets back to that, look for that additional angle. Nobody would ever really think of getting way down actually into the dirt, looking up at the bottom of this thing uh, and putting a little bit of light in there as the best way to, to take a photo of this flower. And if you saw the other side of this flower, it's absolutely beautiful. But I really liked the way this came out too. And then wabi-sabi is um, 
I find this works really great with tulips, actually. So it, it's this whole idea of uh, accepting uh, transience and imperfection. And it's really kind of understanding that, that nothing lasts, um, you know, nothing is finished and nothing is perfect. And so finding things that are past peak, um, you can make some really, really nice images uh, from that as well. Also a great technique to use with architecture. So summarize, uh, depth of field affected by aperture and distance uh, to the subject. Uh, autofocus may not work, so don't let that frustrate you. Um, definitely the apps for depth of field are definitely worth getting one of those uh, tripods can be your best friend. Always check the background and don't be afraid to crop your photos. So with that, uh, open it up for questions. And I didn't think I was going to finish. By the <laughs> Looking over there, I was thinking there is no way. Um, focus stacking is a new thing nowadays, yes. a relatively new thing. Thoughts about that? Yeah, so I do quite a bit. I actually teach a class on that. Um, so the, the thing that's interesting about focus stacking is that there's actually a number of different algorithms that different software products use to actually combine the images. And the results can be very different from one to another. So I actually have a couple of different programs that I use. Um, I use Photoshop, uh, but I also use Helicon. Uh, as well. Helicon actually has three different algorithms. So that, 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 focus stack, is that part of the editing process? Or so it's, it's both. So, um, so the first part is capturing a set of images where you're focusing a little bit deeper with each shot. And it used to be uh, in the early days of digital, and this is something that came about as part of digital. Um, the early days of digital, you had to actually manually focus a little bit deeper you know, for each one. Um, and I'm not sure when the manufacturer started actually putting that feature into the cameras, but now all of the digital cameras out there have this feature built in where you set up the starting point and then you tell it what kind of increment you want for it to focus deeper in and how many shots you want it to take. And then you just, sometimes it's a button that in the menu you hit, sometimes you just hit the shutter, it depends on the manufacturer. Then it goes and it takes all those photos. So that's how you get the initial stack. Then you take that and you bring it into the editing software. And then you tell it that you want it to combine all those. And it looks for the sharpest things in each photo. And then that's what it uses to build this composite. Um, but the different algorithms look for different things to determine the sharpness. And what will happen sometimes is you'll find things that got wrong. Um, and so. I usually do it first in Photoshop. Uh, and the reason I use the Photoshop one is that one seems to do the best job of color. The other ones tend to have a little bit of a color shift that happens when they do that. I'm not quite sure why, but there are times that Helicon will give me a better result than Photoshop will and then and vice versa. And so uh, we, we kind of go through all of that um, within the class but have people play with um, all, the, all the different um, algorithms that, that are available in, in the two programs, but it is really powerful, especially for macro. Uh, I do it quite a bit, um, actually. Um, it was really something that really kind of changed macro photography because now I can stay at f8. I don't have to worry about going to a much smaller aperture, so I don't have to worry about the fraction. I can just take all of those images and, and pull them together and get a really nice result. I'm not seeing questions in the chat so yet. Any questions out there in Zoom land? All the options here. So, what if anything is going on at the arboretum? We're so far away, we don't get over there. Yeah, so right now, that much. Uh, we're kind of in that, that in-between period. They do have the beds all set up. Uh, there's some daffodils up right now. There's some, um, I forget the name of it. It's like a purpley flower that kind of grows in a, a clump like this. Um, there are some past flowers uh, in the, the prairie area that are up. 
Um, but that that's about it. Uh, in about another, I would say two weeks, that the tulips should start to be looking pretty good. Um, they're they're coming up right now, uh, so those should be pretty good. Um, lady slippers will be uh, probably more into mid to late May. Um, and then once, kind of once you hit mid-May, then there's all kinds of things that are, are blooming out there. It becomes, you know, really, um, really kind of a fun place to go and, and shoot. Uh, but right now, there, there's really not much out there. So now when I go over there, um, typically it's just uh, I can get some exercise in. Do they allow tripods? So no, but I can tell you how to use a tripod. So what I've discovered is if you go during the week, and you get there at 8 a.m. in the morning when they open up, you pretty much have the place to yourself. And so they kind of look the other way. You know, as long as it's a small tripod, that they look the other way. Uh, a number of the shots you saw in here were taken on a tripod at, at the Arboretum between 8 and 9. And about 9 o'clock, there's enough people there. Um, they'll tell you you can't do that. Um, but if you're there right at 8 when they open up, you know, usually you can get away with it. Okay. You didn't hear that from me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been there quite a bit, but they don't post no tripods. You never see a sign that says no tripods. That's true. There, there is no sign there, but uh, you'll meet the security people pretty quick. Oh, I've done the same thing. You have got them right away in the morning, and nobody, nobody cares. They're just and, waking up. I think the big thing is they, they just don't want the walkways in that block. I think that's really what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. And the one and only time I was out there was like mid afternoon with a tripod, but the high school kids from Roseville were there causing all sorts of destruction. So they didn't pay any attention to my <laughs> tripod. <laughs> There's always the, you know, the biggest problem, you know, <laughs> you know cause a distraction. Um, got a question here. What do you think of geared heads for macro use? So, um, so that kind of gets back to the um, uh, that, that one tool I showed that allows you to just like move the, the camera back and forth, a focusing rail. Uh, it's the same kind of kind of thing. Um, yeah, so if you're really into it, um, that, that can definitely help. Mm -hmm. Now on days when it isn't rainy, which seems to be few and far between now, um, but you want that the water droplet effect. How well do you just do like just a spray bottle work, or does that actually affect the size of the droplets? Or so so that works. Um, you have to spray more than you think. So the mistake most people make is they don't put enough water. In. Um, but the other thing is make sure you don't just spray the flower. Spray the whole area around it because otherwise people are going to look at the photo and see the wet flower and the dry ground, and then. Yeah, they say, hey, wait a minute. But no, that, that works really well. Yeah. No other questions. We'll wrap it up. Thank you much, Dan. This has been done. This has been great. Um, really appreciate it. Well, thanks. I'm going to end the Zoom.